World News tonight. Terrible tremors. Melbourne faces an unexpected disaster after over a decade of slumber. Controversial attendance. Bolsonaro makes his way through breaching the honor code. Promising news. Johnson & Johnson's revamped single jab that shows better efficacy. Celebrating nation. China showcases some illuminating colors and performances on stage. From the global resources of the Verna Media Network, this is the Verna World News Tonight. Now reporting from Studio 24 in Colombo, here's Suzanne Shainali. Good evening and thank you for joining us on World News Tonight. We start off today's coverage with the panic crisis in Melbourne. A rare earthquake of a 6.0 magnitude rattled southeastern Australia today morning, shaking buildings, knocking down walls and sending panic residents running into the streets of Melbourne. One of Australia's biggest earthquakes on record struck the state of Victoria on Wednesday. Government agency Geoscience Australia said it registered at a magnitude of 6.0 and that its epicenter was near a rural town northeast of Melbourne. The earthquake caused damage to buildings in the country's second largest city, with rubble blocking one of its main streets. Residents of Melbourne recounted the moment the quake hit. Very scary, telling the kids just to get ready to get out in the streets just in case. I looked outside and from my balcony you could see the other the other buildings moving as well and the power line shaking. Tremors could also be felt throughout neighbouring states in cities as far as Adelaide and Sydney. More than half of Australia's population of 25 million live in these affected areas, though no deaths have so far been reported. Prime Minister Scott Morrison, who is currently in Washington, D.C., to meet with U.S. President Joe Biden, spoke to reporters in a news conference. At this stage, um, we have had no reports of, of serious injuries or, or worse, and that is, that is very good news. It can be a very, uh, very disturbing um, event for an earthquake of this nature. They are, not, they are very rare events in Australia. And, uh, and as a result, I'm sure people would have been quite distressed and disturbed by that. The country's Bureau of Meteorology said it had not issued a tsunami threat following the earthquake, which measured higher than the country's deadliest tremor in 1989 that killed 13 people. The United Nations General Assembly session, with its focus on fighting the pandemic, kicked off with a speed from Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, who has bragged about not being vaccinated against COVID-19. World leaders gathered in New York on Tuesday for the United Nations General Assembly with a focus on fighting the pandemic. So it was perhaps curious that the first speaker was Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro, a vaccine skeptic who appeared to openly break the UN's honor code simply by walking in the door. Under the code, UN officials asked that all who enter the hall be vaccinated, though they did not require proof. The far-right leader, who had COVID last year, has bragged about not getting the shot, saying his immune system is strong enough to fend off contracting it again. In his UN address, Bolsonaro appeared conciliatory by saying he does support the vaccine, but immediately pivoted to stress he remains against requiring it for Brazil's citizens, despite slipping poll numbers at home for his handling of the pandemic. He also doubled down on his support of the use of the controversial drug hydroxychloroquine, normally used to treat malaria, that emerged early on as a potential treatment for COVID, but has since been dismissed by many health officials as ineffective and potentially harmful. We don't understand why so many countries, along with most of the media, position themselves against the early treatment. History and science will hold everyone accountable. While Bolsonaro walked the halls of the U.N. unvaccinated, even hugging Secretary General Antonio Guterres, the rest of New York may not have been as welcoming. With no one allowed into the city's restaurants without proof of vaccination, Bolsonaro and his aides appeared to settle for slices of pizza on the sidewalk, as a photo posted to social media by two of his cabinet members showed. Next to speak at the U.N. after the Brazilian leader was his polar opposite when it comes to fighting COVID, U.S. President Joe Biden, but not before the podium was completely sanitized with a hefty wipe down. 
President Biden urged that the world is at an inflection point in the fight against COVID-19 and climate change in his debut speech to the United Nations. Biden has faced criticism from prominent allies recently and sought to turn the page in his remarks by emphasizing relentless diplomacy. Facing growing doubts about his promise to unite America's allies, President Biden delivering his debut speech to the United Nations, calling for global cooperation to combat climate change and COVID. Bombs and bullets cannot defend against COVID-19. We need a collective act of science and political will. Declaring the world is at an inflection point. To deliver for our own people, we must also engage deeply with the rest of the world. The speech, a key credibility test for the president who came into office saying he would restore America's relationships that were frayed under former President Trump. I'm sending a clear message to the world. America is back. But in recent weeks, President Biden's been criticized by prominent allies, most notably for America's chaotic troop withdrawal from Afghanistan. Today, the president trying to turn the page. We've ended 20 years of conflict in Afghanistan. And as we close this period of relentless war, we're opening a new era of relentless diplomacy. That message comes after a stunningly sharp rebuke from France, accusing the Biden administration of a, quote, stab in the back. France, for the first time ever, recalling its ambassador after a dispute over the U.S. sale of nuclear-powered submarines to Australia. Then there's the U.S.'s rivalry with China, the president never mentioning the country by name. We are not seeking a new Cold War. The United States is ready to work with any nation that steps up and pursues peaceful resolution to shared challenges. Topping that list, climate change. Ahead of a crucial summit this fall, President Biden vowing to double American aid to poorer nations tackling the climate crisis. Whether we choose to fight for our shared future or not will reverberate for generations yet to come. U.S. President Joe Biden and British Prime Minister Boris Johnson discussed the dangers of climate change and stacked out common ground on trade and new security agreement with Australia during an Oval Office meeting aimed at highlighting the U.S.-British alliance. Let's cross over to other than a world news pressure correspondent Nicola Sena Ratna who joins us now from New York in the United States. Nicola. Yes, Shanali. Britain told the visiting U.K. Prime Minister who once worried his warm relationship with former President Donald Trump would hurt relations under the U.S. Democratic leader, that he looked forward to coming to the United Kingdom for a conference on global warming later this year. Under Biden, the United States has renewed pledges to cut greenhouse gases and promised to finance projects to combat climate change. Biden said trade talks are open when asked about a potential UK-US trade agreement which would be a great significance for post-Britex Britain. Biden also said that he did not want to see any change in the border status between Northern Ireland and the Great Britain, negotiated under the peace accords due to Britain's exit from Europe. Under the protocol, Britain agreed to leave some EU rules in place in Northern Ireland and accept checks on goods arriving from elsewhere in the United Kingdom in order to preserve an open land border with EU member state Ireland. Johnson's team regards the visit as a trump, demonstrating that Britain can thrive on the world stage after its divorcing last year from the European Union. It comes amid a U.S. raid with the EU rival France in which Britain played a crucial part. Back to you, Shanali. All right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Nicola Sena Ratner reporting from New York in the United States. The FBI revealed that human remains found in Wyoming are those of missing 22-year-old Gabby Petito, who went missing during a road trip with her fiancé. The initial determination for the manner of death is homicide. The FBI confirmed on Tuesday that a body found in a Wyoming national park is indeed Gabby Petito. The young woman who went missing on a cross-country road trip with her fiancé, Brian Laundry. Her death has been ruled a homicide, with the cause of death pending final autopsy results. 
Her disappearance grabbed national headlines after Petito's family reported the 22-year-old missing on September 11th, 10 days after Laundry returned home to Northport, Florida without her. What's going on? How come you're crying? Police in Moab, Utah released body camera footage last week of an August 12th encounter officers had with the couple. And you would have let me in the car? After 911 dispatchers got this phone call. Uh, we drove by and a gentleman was slapping the girl. He was slapping her? Yes, and then we stopped. They ran up and down the sidewalk. He proceeded to hit her, hopped in the car, and they drove off. In the police video, Petito is sobbing as she describes a quarrel with laundry that she says became physical. The officers did not detain the couple, but insisted that they spend that night separately. Investigators have called laundry a person of interest in the case, and now the 23-year-old is missing. His parents told FBI agents they last saw him a week ago and that he'd planned to hike in the nearby 24,000-acre Carlton Reserve Wilderness Area, where police are now searching. Before disappearing, Laundry refused to speak with investigators and retained a lawyer. Search On Monday, FBI agents searched his parents' home, taking away cardboard boxes and towing away a silver Ford Mustang. Let's go into a short commercial break. We'll be back soon with more World News. Welcome back. Moving on to yet another election update. Over in Japan, the LDP elections have taken center stage despite COVID concerns as front runners continue to keep the campaigns running with nuclear threats looming around the country's borders. To get more details on this, we have other than a world news special correspondent, Rasida Chandradasa, who joins us now from Tokyo in Japan. Rasida. Good evening, Shanali. Another North Korean missile flew past the Japan EEZ, which is the exclusive economic zone, last week and drew strong condemnation from the Prime Minister Suga Yoshide and, and his Japanese allies, and also put the local defense forces on alert. So, and there was another news that the people watched very closely, which was the defense pact between US, UK, and Australia. And no wonder Japan would want to join that pact because they certainly have reservations and concerns over the dominance of the China. So these things would put security in the headlines of in the LDP leadership election. Takaichi Sanai-san, with the backing of ex-Prime Minister Abe-san, runs on a strong security and the economic policies. And she's, she's, her hawkish policies is extremely China skeptic and she's expected to gain uh, from these things. And no wonder that she's gathering momentum and already have around 70 parliamentarians supporting her, even though she's struggling to penetrate into party uh, regional voters, party, party member voters. Uh, as expected, the leaders Kishida-san and the Kono-san, Kishida-san is the former prime, uh, foreign minister and Kono-taro is the current vaccine minister, is, are leading the votes. And both are expected to dominate both the parliamentarian and the regional party votes. Even though the, the votes happen that if the no one able to get the majority, this would go to the second round and most would think the second round would be a battle between the Kishida son and the Konotaro son. There was a one surprise last week. After attempting four times to declare her candidacy, Noda Seiko san finally was able to gather 20 parliamentarian signatures and declared her candidacy on Friday. Even though this came as a surprise, it was even more surprising to see the members who supported her. Out of 20, eight members came from the General Secretary Nikai-san's faction, which I would believe was a, a big concern for the Konotaro-san because he was expected to get Nikai-san's fullest backing. But these things happen in Japanese politics and we may see even more surprises when the election comes closer. We also have announcement from the parliamentarian speaker that there will be extraordinary parliamentarian session on October 4th. And that session would select the 100th Prime Minister of Japan. And obviously the next, that would be the 100th Prime Minister, would be the person who win the LDP's leadership election. Over to you, all right, thank you. That was other than a world news special correspondent Rasita Chandra Dasa reporting from Tokyo in Japan. Children are finally heading back to school in Lebanon for the first time in almost two years. However, crippling phone shortages and financial crisis are challenging parents. For the first time in nearly two years, Lebanese children are heading back to school. 
after the global health crisis and widespread protests interrupted face-to-face -face teaching. But as schools prepared to open their doors at the start of the academic year, crippling fuel shortages and the country's ongoing financial crisis are challenging parents and putting the education sector under fresh strain. Father of three, Omar Mansour, now walks his daughter to school as he can no longer afford bus fees and he has no fuel to drive her. As Lebanon's financial collapse continues to worsen, three quarters of the country's population has fallen into poverty and the local currency has lost 90% of its value in the past two years. Lebanon's education system was once prized throughout the Middle East and ranked 10th globally by the World Economic Forum, but it is now on its knees. Lebanon's financial meltdown has meant that across the country, fuel shortages are affecting almost every sector, leaving many increasingly reliant on private generators. After a year of political deadlock, Lebanon's new prime minister, Najib Mikati, took office this month vowing to tackle the crisis. The new government has also been urged by a group of Lebanon's bondholders that include some of the world's biggest investment funds, to begin debt restructuring talks as soon as possible to try and address the situation. Johnson & Johnson says new data shows that if given within two months of the first shot, a second dose can provide 94% protection against moderate and severe forms of COVID-19. Amid the debate over the necessity of booster doses, Johnson & Johnson says a second shot of its COVID-19 vaccine boosts protection. The drug maker said Tuesday a booster shot administered about two months after the first increased its effectiveness to 94% in the United States against moderate to severe forms of the disease. That's much higher than a single dose, which offers 70% protection. And the wider the gap between the two shots, the more effective the booster. J&J &J said a booster given two months after the first dose increased antibody levels four to six times. But when given six months after the first, antibody levels rocketed 12-fold. The data has not been peer-reviewed, but it will help J&J, &J, the only producer of a single-shot coronavirus vaccine, make its case to U.S. regulators for a booster shot. The company says it has submitted its data to the Food and Drug Administration. So far, only Pfizer and BioNTech have submitted sufficient data for evaluation on booster shots. U.S. regulators could authorize their booster shot for older and some high-risk Americans early this week, in time for the government to roll them out by Friday. Shares of Johnson & Johnson rose in early trading Tuesday. We have some good news for you. Soda giant PepsiCo will cut back on the use of virgin plastic and expand its business to more markets amid growing calls from consumers, clients and climate change advocates to combat plastic waste. PepsiCo wants to cut back on the use of new plastic and plans to expand its soda stream sparkling water business as part of that strategy. The drinks and snacks giant announced a goal Wednesday to reduce new plastic use per serving by half across all of its brands by 2030 and used 50% recycled content in all its plastic packing. The initiative called PEP Plus is a response to growing calls from consumers, clients and climate change advocates to fight plastic waste. Its main rival, Coca-Cola, already has plans to sell bottles that are fully made from recycled plastic in the United States. According to a Greenpeace report, Coke generates over 100 billion bottles of single-use plastic each year, while PepsiCo, with everything from its plastic drinks bottles to plastic snacks bags, uses 2.3 million metric tons of plastic over the same period. PepsiCo CEO Ramon Laguata told in an interview that by scaling up the soda stream do-it-yourself sparkling water business it bought in 2018, that could help reduce the use of more than 200 billion plastic bottles by 2030. SodaStream makes machines and refillable cylinders that let users make their own soda or carbonated water drinks at home. Welcome back and for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. 
Indigenous activities delivered a tree by truck on the embassy of Norway in Brasilia at the same time that Brazil's far right president Jair Bolsonaro defended his government's record in slowing Amazon deforestation. A Chinese representative urged the United States and Australia to tighten supervision over their private security firms to better protect the human rights of migrants and refugees. Taliban spokesman announced some acting ministers to the newly established interim government at a press conference. And finally tonight, China highly anticipated mid-autumn festival gala was aired, presenting a magnificent visual feast to global audiences with nearly 30 exquisite artistic performances. The gala consists of three chapters offered a blend of traditional elements and advanced technologies showcasing a paranormal picture of Chinese culture and history. It was simultaneously broadcast overseas for the first time. The first part of the gala themed moon rises to the mid-autumn attracted audiences with various elements of traditional Chinese culture. The second part themed moon and hometown includes 12 songs to show people nostalgia, a sentiment rooted deep within a nation's spirit and affection to the motherland. Themed the full moon and the realization of dreams, the third part of the TV gala included singing and dancing performances and the presence of Olympic champions and gifts from the space. As one of the traditional Chinese festivals, the Mid-Autumn Festival is an important time of the year for family reunions. People usually appreciate the moon, visit lantern shows, fly balloon lanterns or have dragon boat races to celebrate the festival. <laughs> And that's all the news we have for you tonight. Anuradhi will be back tomorrow with another edition of World News. I'm Suzanne Shinali. Until then, stay safe and have a good night.